I have a smartphone, everyone does, right? And um, uh, recently, I changed the, the passcode lock screen thing. Um, I had this complicated numerical passcode, and I thought, why I make it so complex? And so I changed it to just the same number over and over, just did, 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 and I get into my phone really quickly. Genius idea, right? You can take that home with you. Um, anyway, my problem was, I'd fixed it up so it was a whole lot easier, but I kept on forgetting. And so I'd go back and do the did, 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 nah, did, 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 ah, nah, and just forget that there was something so simple that I could get into the phone really quickly. And this whole series we've been talking about, things that we forget about God, we've looked at four truths about God that we just forget. And we keep going back to these complex ways when there's something so much simpler, so much easier, so much better that we can, that we can take hold of. So number one, God is great, so I don't have to be in control. We talked about Asaph. He was a psalmist. He wrote Psalm 77, just stuck up at night, not being able to sleep because he feels like everything is out of control, and then realizing that God is great, so I don't have to be in control. Amen? Number two, God is glorious, so I don't have to be afraid. Paul is writing this letter to Timothy, and he's, he's pulling back the curtain, like we see the curtain come back in Revelation, and we see the glory of Jesus Christ, and just there is no fear there for those who belong to Jesus Christ. And Paul is saying, this is you, Timothy. You're on Jesus' side. And not only that, but his glorious spirit is poured into you. There is no need. There is no room to be afraid because God is glorious and he is working in you. Amen? Preach that to yourself. And number three, God is good. So I don't have to look at elsewhere. Last week, we looked at um, the story of, of Joseph betrayed by his brothers, betrayed by his boss's wife, betrayed by his friends in prison, and just worse. Things go from bad to worse, and yet God is working through it all. And I think this is summed up really well in the New Testament. In John chapter 6, uh, these people are walking away from Jesus, and he says to his disciples, are you guys going to leave too? And Peter says, where would we go? You have the words of eternal life that you are the good one and nothing else. You are good, so why are we gonna look elsewhere? God is good, so I don't have to look elsewhere. And then this week, the fourth one, the fourth thing that we need to preach to ourselves daily, that God is gracious, so I don't have to prove myself. Um, I got married at the age of 29, so I spent um, a fair chunk of my late teens and 20s dating. Um, trying to find the perfect woman. And this, this whole time, just trying to display myself as the perfect man. And um, even for a guy like me, that takes a bit of effort. And <clears throat> just trying to um, prove myself to these girls. And I don't know, somehow they figured out that I wasn't the guy that I was trying to prove myself to be until I met Claire. And she's like, doesn't even matter. I'm going to love you anyway. And then she married me. And just when we got married, just this sense of, oh, I don't have to prove myself anymore. <laughs> she loves me for who I am. I still try and you know, be a good guy and everything, but it wasn't about trying to prove myself to her that was going to keep her there. She had already said, I'm yours. And there's a real freedom that comes out of that, right? Um, and it's a really good and positive thing. And when I was thinking about a passage to, to talk about God's graciousness, I I reckon he gave me this one, and I was struggling with it, and because um, it's really pretty negative, right? And we'll get into it in a minute. And just thinking, I think for us, we really do miss the point of how serious it is to forget God's grace and try and prove ourselves to Him over and over. And here is Jesus telling us why trying to prove ourselves to God is a problem, and it's a real problem. So here's the scene. It's Jerusalem. You're in the temple, and it's packed because it's, it's festival time. There's crowds of people coming from everywhere, and, and Jesus has been talking to the crowds in the temple, and he's just, just taken on this volley of questions from um, the religious leaders, from the Pharisees and the scribes and the Sadducees. They're trying to pick holes in his argument, and uh, all the people are just coming at him and asking him these questions. And he's told these stories, really loosely veiled stories, about um, how, how so far off the plot 
these uh, religious leaders are. And then, right here in this moment, in chapter 23, he comes out with it. And he's not holding back anymore. And he says some of the harshest words that you will hear him say. And he's brutal. But he's surgical. And here's the thing, right? Brutal is one thing. Surgical is another. Both of them hurt, but surgical. I'm really hoping that as we look at this, that even if it does hurt, I'm I'm praying that this is going to bring healing. This is going to cut out all of that, proving ourselves to God. And he's got two groups in his sights. One of them is the scribes. These were the expert Bible teachers. And then there was the Pharisees, and these were the, the expert Bible keepers. These were the guys that followed the letter of the law. And so as we look at this, we've got to be really sober about this because the scribes and the Pharisees They were up here in terms of their reputation and being the most sincere and religious people around. They would put us to shame in terms of following God and and having it live out in their lives. And yet Jesus was unflinchingly severe on them. What would he say to us? Man, we need grace. And Jesus said to the crowd and to his disciples, the scribes and the Pharisees sit on, the Mo- on Moses' seat. So practice and observe whatever they tell you, but not what they do. For they preach, but do not practice. They tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to move them with their finger. Tying up heavy burdens, this burden of trying to prove yourself to someone. It's this heavy burden. And they do all their deeds to be seen by others, for they make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long, and we don't do that, right? In fact, anybody got a phylactery here tonight? This is a church. You can say, honestly, a phylactery. If you don't know what it is, it was a little box that they would put on their forehead or they would tie to their arm, and they would have um, scripture verses in there. In fact, um, uh, they found a couple of these uh, in Qumran, where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. So this was stuff from back in Jesus' day, and they found it just recently, two of these little phylacteries. And they opened up this little, like, one-inch square little leather pouch, and they opened it up, and there was four little compartments in there. And each compartment had this tiny little scroll. And you pull out the little scroll, and I didn't do that. I mean, obviously experts are doing it. And, and they read what was on there. And they each had a verse from the Old Testament. Um, Two from Exodus, uh, two from Deuteronomy. And each verse said a really similar thing. You shall bind these words as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. That makes sense, right? But here's the thing. If you are going to pick four verses and tie them to yourself so that you can pull them out at a moment when you're really stuck and you need some encouragement, Why would you pick those verses? Why would you pick verses about keeping verses on your head in a box on your head? You're already following that verse. You need something bigger than that. This is a picture of them just following the letter of the law, but not the heart of the law. And they were wearing them big. Jesus has said they're big. It's like spiritual bling on these people. They wanted to be seen as being these really super hyper spiritual people that were following following God like no one else because they wanted to prove themselves to God and we don't do that we don't have tassels some of you might have tassels I'm not going to judge it but what kind of spiritual bling have you been polishing today getting here tonight standing here tonight and Jesus calls them out on, on that and on wanting to make a name for themselves. And he finishes, well, he goes on to say in verse 12, whoever exalts himself will be humbled and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. And then he kicks in to the woes, the seven woes. And I want us to use them as tests tonight. He's talking to these super religious people and I want, I want us to try and feel it ourselves and I want, try not to flinch. And what Jesus has got to say, I want these words to penetrate our hearts. I'm I'm trying to let them penetrate mine. Um, And are they exposing any any attempts in you at self-proof? Woe number one, slamming the door. Verse 13, But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces, for you neither enter yourselves nor allow those who would enter to go in. 
shutting the door. Just picture this. The door opened to the kingdom of heaven. Back the chapter before, Jesus talks about the kingdom of heaven being like this wedding feast. And do you know who's going into the wedding feast? Poor, hungry people. And he's saying, come in, come in. And can you imagine just being at the door and seeing this poor beggar just shuffling up to the door, wondering whether to go in and just, bam, slamming the, the door in their face. That's what he's saying they're doing. And just imagine, like, if, if your own tummy, like, is just grumbling, and you're like, nah, not going to do it. And shut the door on, on yourself. These people just insisting that they'll go on themselves, trying so hard to prove themselves to God, sitting out in the cold and starving. Is that you? Just trying to do things in your own strength and not even getting through the door. That's woe number one. Woe number two is wreaking havoc. Verse 15. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you travel across sea and land to make a single proselyte. That's a convert. And when he becomes a proselyte, you make him twice as much a child of hell as yourselves. Traveling this whole distance and, and going to all this effort in order to do something they think is really good, but in the end is doing twice as much damage. Throwing ourselves into our faith without fully understanding it does more damage than good. Enthusiasm doesn't necessarily help. In fact, it can make things a whole lot worse. Um, for Christmas uh, last year, I'm an awesome dad. Uh, Claire and I, we bought a cubby house, secondhand cubby house for our kids. And I was putting this cubby house together, and some of the bits were a bit old and decrepit, so I put in some, some new floorboards um, for the front deck of this cubby house. But they were still a little bit rough. So I called Pastor Jeff, who lives around the corner, and he's very handy, and he has a large selection of power tools. Now you know. And um, I asked if I could borrow his electric plane um, so that I could get these, because um, I was using an, an old hand plane, it was taking me forever, and like, Christmas is coming. And so I, I get his, hand, his electric plane, and I'm very enthusiastic about using this plane, except I didn't know whether I was adjusting the blade to go um, further into the wood or out of the wood, and in my ignorance and um, in my enthusiasm, I ended up just destroying, <laughs> shredding the deck and uh, breaking the blade on the plane. I replaced it, but our enthusiasm can just make things worse if we don't really understand what we're doing. Jesus calls the, the Pharisees and the scribes blind guides. It's like you're going up to Moriarty. You're not going to take someone blind to guide you there, right? Because they're not going to know the good parts to see, and they're probably going to send you over the edge. Blind guides. You don't follow a blind guide. They're going to do more damage. If we don't daily remember grace and our place because of it, if we're just bent on proving ourselves to God, it's not just hurting us, but it's hurting other people because people get the wrong idea about what it means to follow Jesus if all we're about is worrying about proving ourselves to God and to others. We're going to do damage. Verse 16. Verse 16. This is the third woe, playing little games. Woe to you blind guides who say, if anyone swears by the temple, it's nothing. But if anyone swears by the gold of the temple, he's bound by his oath. You blind fools. For which is greater, the gold or the temple that has made the gold sacred? The Pharisees and the scribes, they're making these loopholes for themselves that one oath, if, it's, if, if you're swearing on this, it's good. If you're swearing on that, mm, it doesn't really matter. They're... They're saying whatever they want. Ultimately, they're not playing games with gold. They're playing games with God. And they're changing the rules and they're making these judgment calls about what counts and what doesn't. Blind fools. And he says, it's not about the gold. It's not about the gift on the altar. It's not even about the altar it's not even about the temple that makes the altar sacred. It's not even about, just pan back from that. 
not just to the temple, but to heaven, and not just to heaven, but to the throne in heaven, and not just to the throne, but who is on the throne. That's what we've got to be focusing on, is God. And yet we play these games, and we try to make these little distinctions for ourselves and say, ah, this is all right, but this isn't. (coughs) I can't watch porn on my phone. I know that. I'm not going to do that. But it's okay to watch this movie that has a sex scene in it or this TV series that's just going to drag my mind through the muck. Just changing the rules a little bit. Or I'll make a pledge here in church on a Sunday night and it's going to mean every part of me and it's going to feel, I'm really fired up in the moment and I'm going to make this count until Tuesday. And then it's not going to mean much at all until Sunday comes again, and then it's going to count again. We've got these two two rules going on. This oath counts, and this one doesn't. So often we fool ourselves into thinking that we can prove ourselves good enough for God just by changing the rules a little, that he's going to be cool with that. How could we think he wouldn't notice? How could we think it wouldn't matter and that it wouldn't hurt us? Just playing these little games. Woe number four is bargaining. Verse 23. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and come and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. You blind guides, you straining out a gnat and swallowing a camel. They were giving a, a tenth of everything, and that was really good, but they were stuck on little things and missing the big things. It's like they were putting God's law into boxes, not into their hearts. Here's the question. Are we settling for the comfortable laws, the ones that are easy to do, over the costly ones? Do we do the bare minimum just to feel good and ignore the debt of love that is always owing? Here's the irony. They'd strain out these gnats because they were impure, and you can't, you can't eat something that's impure. And then swallow a camel, and both of them are unclean. It's ridiculous. There's another question. What camels are you swallowing? Have you got yourself so focused on the nitty-gritty of the Christian life, and just so focused on getting this stuff right here, and, and neglecting stuff that's falling apart over here? Are you thinking you can bargain with God like this? I'm going to nail it in these three or four or five things here that I know I can nail. And I'm just hoping that if I get a passing grade with God on these four or five things that I've got down, then this one thing over here, it's all going to balance out. It's bargaining with God. And we do it to try to prove ourselves to him by just distracting him from what's really going on. That's woe number four is bargaining. Woe number five is clean outside but dirty inside. Verse 25, woe to you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but inside they're full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and the plate that the outside also may be clean. Just imagine this. like um, It's Monday morning. It's got to about 10 o'clock and your brain's gone fuzzy, and you need a coffee. And so you've gone to the kitchen, um, and you've gone to pick up this, this gleaming, sparkling mug. It's Timon's mug. It's his favorite one, and it's a Monday. He's not here. And you're just going to take that one, because you know it's going to be good. And it looks beautiful. And then you start pouring a coffee in, and you realize that inside it's like week old coffee custard. And it's just... He hasn't, again, he hasn't cleaned his coffee mug and it's just festering and no matter how good that shot of coffee is that goes in there, you're not going to drink that. And if you do, it's going to make you very, very ill. And that's what it's like. It doesn't matter how good it looks on the outside, if it's filthy on the inside, it's going to do you a whole lot of harm. So here's the question. Trying to prove ourselves to God, just looking good on the outside. And on the inside, we're still dirty. What deep-set thoughts 
what deep set assumptions that I need to make myself right with God and look good to God are actually contaminating the good news for you. Are you coming here on a Sunday we're digging into your Bible during the week and, and getting this good stuff out of it, but then letting it go into a heart that is still fixed on proving yourself to God. Just like that clean coffee going into that filthy, old, moldy, rotten ideas and just contaminating your gospel. We try to prove ourselves to God by keeping the outside clean and the inside is filthy in it. No matter how much good stuff we hear, it just gets contaminated when it's in here because we're still clinging to these, this need to prove ourselves to God. That's clean outside and dirty inside. And the next woe, woe number six, clean outside and dead inside. Verse 27, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you're like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanness. So you also outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. This is a, this is a pathetic image. Just this beautiful tomb. I live in Anfield right next to the cemetery, and they've got this ridiculously big marble monolith for some family that has a whole lot of money. And it, it looks spectacular, and it must have cost them heaps for this enormous sarcophagus. But what's inside? Bones. Dead, rotting bones. This is dead heart. It's not just unclean inside, he's saying. It's dead inside. And this is the question, are you killing yourself spiritually by trying to prove yourself to God? Are you feeling demoralized because you've fallen yet again? You had this moment a while back and you resolved to get serious about Jesus, to read your Bible more, to, to pray more, to serve somewhere, to, to do something, just to pursue God and, and you're going really well and then a week or two later you're just feeling spiritually numb and dead and you, and you feel like no progress has been made and, and you're actually killing yourself on the inside because what you're doing is not springing from the grace of God. It's, it's a desperate need to try and prove yourself to God without accepting his grace. We try to prove ourselves to God in ways that look good on the outside. But they're actually killing us internally because they don't spring from grace. Woe number seven is thinking that you're better. Verse 29, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you build the tombs of the prophets and decorate the monuments of the righteous, saying, if we'd lived in the days of our fathers, we would not have taken part with them in shedding the blood of the prophets. This is a really dangerous one for me. Because I think I'm better. And really, I'm really proud I look at others and I think, that's not me. I haven't failed like they've failed. I don't need to get as desperate as them because I've got this under control myself. And I'll get things sorted out for God. And I can live this life for God in a way that will be pleasing to him without having to get desperate and messy and open and honest and embarrassed and mucky about it all. because I'm thinking that I am better than anyone else. Have you tricked yourself into thinking that you're better? That you don't need to avail yourself of God's grace so desperately, because that's the, the trap that the scribes and the Pharisees are walking into, and they, they think that they're better than their ancestors, that they killed the prophets, but we never would have done that. And here's the thing, that they're shaping up to do something far, far worse Verse 31, thus you witness against yourselves that you are sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of your fathers. You serpents, you brood of vipers, how are you to escape being sentenced to hell? Therefore, I send you prophets and wise men and scribes, some of whom you will kill and crucify. Jesus is saying, you've done it before, you're gonna do it again. I'm predicting what's gonna happen in the future to the apostles in the early church, they're gonna get slaughtered. so that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on earth from the blood of, the inno of innocent Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Barakiah, whom you murdered between the sanctuary and the altar. 
truly I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. The scribes and the Pharisees aren't just guilty of, of all the errors of the past, but they'll also bring on themselves the guilt of the future. We can't prove ourselves to God. Even if we could deal with all of that stuff from the past and just whitewash over it and cover it over so that God wouldn't notice it, we're still going to do more stuff in the future. We can't keep on covering it up. There's not enough whitewash. It's all going to come out. Jesus is saying some really hard truths here, and these words sound really negative and damning, but we need to take them to heart surgically. It's when we approach God trying to prove ourselves to him. We're being as clueless and offensive and as destructive as those Pharisees and those scribes were being when they killed every one of those prophets. It's dangerous. It's deadly to rely on self-proof because it, it kills us. And it says the wrong message to everyone else that being a Christian is all about looking good and, and, and getting everything right before God before God gets you right with him. Making them twice a child of hell as yourselves. By trying to prove ourselves to God, we're not just taking the difficult route. We're taking the deadly route. And we need to get this, that trying to prove ourselves to God is deadly. Verse 33, how are you to escape being sentenced to hell. And Jesus gives us a gracious, gracious solution. After saying all that he said, you can just imagine in the temple there with everyone bearing down on him, just the tension in the air and the death stares he would be getting. And maybe, just maybe, some signs of conviction in some of them. But his words are really cutting through. Now Jesus says something extraordinary in that setting as they're staring him down. Verse 37, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it, how often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings and you would not. He's just spoken about the way these people have killed the prophets time and again and again and again and again and they're going to do it in the future and he knows full well that they're going to do it to him in a few days. This brood of vipers just surrounding him, coming at him to strike. And what does he say he is? A mother hen amongst a brood of vipers. And his heart breaks for them. How I long to gather you in like a mother hen. Psalm 91.4 says, Under his wings you shall find refuge, covered by the shadow of his wings. Despite all they're trying to do to prove themselves to God, he's saying, just come, just come in. And this brood of vipers within a couple of days are going to nail him to the cross. And the, the beautiful irony of all of that is that as these people are trying to prove themselves to God, prove themselves to God, Jesus, God, works through that in a way that brings grace. This brood of vipers, they try to harm him, but the mother hen wins, not flinching, but reaching out to save and to protect. That's the beauty of the cross is that it's all about what he has done, not about us and how we look and how we prove ourselves to him. And no matter how dangerous we get, that he still gathers us in. No matter how evil and mixed up those guys were and all the words that he said about how wrong they were, and yet he could say, I just want to gather you in. That's grace. And Jesus' solution to our woes is staggering, amazing grace. So what is our response to that? And Jesus says, I long to gather you, and you would not. 
Don't let him say the same of you. He, he longs to cover you with his wings to be the grace that you need to say, stop proving yourself to me. I've done all the proving you need. Just come in. You need to give up your anxious efforts. You need to give up striving. You need to give up pretending. You need to give up worrying about what other people are saying or thinking about you and just come to him because he offers his grace. Don't let it be said of you and you would not take it. We need to humble ourselves before Jesus Christ. These guys that were missionaries going all over the place to try and bring people to what they thought was God, that had built these monuments, that had done these amazing things that would tithe week in, week out, and Jesus is saying, that's not enough. You've got to come to me. If he was going to humble them, he needs to humble us too. And this is the only appropriate response. Back in verse 12, Jesus says, whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. That's how we come to him. We need to humble ourselves before him. And, and not try and do it in our own strength and prove ourselves. It's not about our own works. It's about letting his grace work. A few weeks later, in the same place, Peter is there in Jerusalem, and he's telling them all what you've done. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. And now when they heard it, and there would have been this, some of the same people in that crowd, when they heard it, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? What is our only appropriate response? And Peter said to them, repent. And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Repent and turn from your sin. Be baptized into this new covenant of grace, not of works. And you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself that they just needed to leave it all behind. And Jesus is saying, this is what it's going to look like if you keep proving yourself. You're just going to destroy and destroy. But if you come to me, this is for you. This grace is for you. You don't have to prove yourself to me to have it. It's yours, and it's for your children and for anyone who would come. Grace is freely available to those murderers. It's freely available to us. Just repent and turn humbly to him. Don't try to bargain with God or change the rules with him. Stop trying to swallow camels. And don't contaminate this gospel truth that you're hearing with these thoughts inside that I've just got to prove my, myself to God with this one thing or I'm just going to hold on to this one thing. I don't want him to, to, to mess with that yet and have this dirty heart that ends up just dead. And don't think that you're better than the Pharisees and the scribes that you don't need this. We all need this. So come, let him gather you like a mother hen and don't stand back proud and stubborn like the Pharisees. They're just killing themselves spiritually standing there and killing others spiritually and you don't want to do that because when you come and you receive his grace, this grace transforms you. And that we realize that we are just like everyone else, all of us sinners, that we're not better than anyone else. And yet he accepts us. And that truth comes alive in our hearts from the inside out. Life comes and we're cleansed from the inside out. And the, the temptation to prove ourselves to others or to God is, is gradually just washed away and eroded. And we no longer feel compelled to, to bargain or, or play games with God. And we stop leading other people astray as this grace just, just lives out in our lives as we proclaim that truth to ourselves daily that God is gracious. So I don't need to prove myself. And then instead of leading people astray, we're leading them to the kingdom. And together with others, we're coming to this great wedding feast. And we're feasting, hungry, hungry people feasting on the grace of God together. That's what happens when we accept his grace. It transforms us. It transforms everyone. Whatever's holding on to you, you need to let it go. 
and give it to Jesus. Let him take control. Let his grace overwhelm you. And don't keep doing what the Pharisees were doing, loading these burdens on their shoulders. Jesus says, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. You don't have to prove yourself. I was just thinking of how much stress I've caused and how much time I've wasted and, and how much hurt I've, I've caused for myself and for other people just by trying to prove myself to God when he's just saying, come and receive grace. So with humble hearts, we're no longer trying to prove ourselves to God, but knowing that his grace is ours, then we say these words that Jesus proclaims in the final verse. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. 